Namaste and welcome to my channel, Indigo Angel. Today I'd like to welcome a special guest, Carrie Cassidy from the Project Camelot channel. And honestly, I cannot think of one other person that I'd rather be talking to right now. So I'm very excited and appreciative that you said yes to talking with me today. And if you don't know who Carrie Cassidy is, she is a matriarch in whistleblower testimony and conspiracy, theoretical and truth-seeking journalism and interviews. And she has traveled all over to get some of the best interviews on YouTube, in my opinion. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you and honor you for your integrity. Um, and as I know, you have been received as a gateway for so many um, to receive this knowledge to the galactic interworking networks and truth-seeking intel. So um, what, what I have personally come to love about you, Carrie, is your bold moves and your ability to stay confident under pressure with navigating the flow of your interviews. And I also wanted to let you know that I have prepared a lot of questions for you today. And I want to leave my personal perception out of it as much as possible because I do feel that your voice is the most important thing to be heard. And I feel that um, uh, if, if there's something that uh, you, uh, you cannot answer, please just let me know. And if I say something incorrect, please just um, correct me as well. And, and I have learned that through you. I feel like I've um, taken notes as to, I guess, um, proper interviewing etiquette. I've, I've learned that through watching you. So thank you for that. Um, and I, and so I was just wondering if you can just go ahead and actually share with us actually how you came into this kind of work and give us an owner, an overview of how you came to be where you are today. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for having me on your show. And I, I am recording this and I don't know if it's going to work uh, properly. So bear with me. Uh, but hopefully your copy will be better than mine. Because uh, <laughs> I'm having some weird anomalies going on right now. So that's maybe par for the course. So uh, it's great to be here and um, go ahead. <laughs> Um, yes, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, I, I just was wondering how um, you actually came into this line of work. Um, how you began or how you decided how you knew that you were ready to begin this type of interviewing and journalism and, and um, seeking into this deeper intel overall. Okay, well, uh, Basically, I, I did become a journalist in college. I actually studied journalism, unlike um, I think most of the people out there doing interviews nowadays uh, don't come from a journalistic background. So, uh, like I said, I, I wrote for the school paper. Um, I went to Sonoma State University and uh, I majored in English, although I also majored in uh, sociology. I, I did master's work in sociology. So. I was studying uh, political science as well and par paranormal, the paranormal, because uh, Sonoma State University at that time, and I don't know what it's like anymore, but it was uh, sort of a, one of the more avant-garde radical schools that brought forward uh, investigations into uh, paranormal and, and other dimensions and, and things of this nature. So they were also quite radical in terms of its politics and I interviewed people like Angela Davis and Maya Angelou and uh, and and so on and, and was sort of fairly active in that area as well. So that was my very early background and then after college I got into the entertainment industry and I uh, basically was, I studied, first of all I, I went to New York and I studied acting and I studied directing and then I came back to uh, the United States, uh, not the United States, but I came back to California uh, four years later and moved to LA and broke into the entertainment business. And I, um, I, I, you know, did development and got involved in being a reader, reading screenplays and recommending them or not for television and movies and worked for HBO, what's called Premier Films for a while, as well as a freelance uh, reader for I, uh, the major talent agencies like CAA, ICM, and William Morris. So 
I was involved there and I also worked at Sony Studios um, as a, what you call a, a roving uh, executive assistant. So I worked for a lot of the very top people like John Peters and Peter Goober back in the day and uh, Frank Price, et cetera, on a temporary basis, uh, sort of moving around and learning the business in all aspects. And uh, eventually uh, the entertainment business took like a dive and I got involved in working for Jet Propulsion Lab uh, in their media division as a consultant and helping them as the scientists and engineers to package themselves uh, in, a, in certain products uh, that they were trying to get involved in and productions and in media productions. So uh, I advised them in that way. And, um, and also then eventually that job, uh, you know, dried up and it was over. And so then I became an executive assistant over there and had a lot of free time uh, and I ended up writing screenplays on my lunch hour. And then I broke into being an independent producer. I also went to an executive MBA program at UCLA. And uh, so I had, I sort of got a business compliment to my very creative background. Uh, and, and so that was very uh, advantageous, I guess you might say, and progressed in that regard and became an independent producer trying to package projects myself and reached a sort of a brick wall and or a ceiling. And so I, um, I then made the transition into uh, to, to doing things on my own and, and, sh and, and started picking up a, a consumer grade camcorder and shooting uh, actually videos, UFO videos. And that's when I connected with my former partner who we began Camelot, Project Camelot officially together uh, in 2006, although I'd been filming since 2005, and uh, put our skill sets together, and 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 the rest is history, as as they say. Okay, thank you. Um, wow, you have a very extensive background. Um, are are you still working with that same partner that you initially started your channel with in 2006? Oh no. Um, so Bill Ryan and I had uh, sort of a major parting of the ways three years into the project. Mm -hmm. I've been doing Camelot now for 15 years. So it was quite a long time ago now, but at any rate, in the early days, we agreed on all the different witnesses. We were traveling the world with a consumer grade camcorder. We were quite, quite unusual at the time. Now there are a million channels doing what we do, but uh, back then we were very unique and uh, we had a, I had a small inheritance from my mother who passed on and so we we survived in the early days on that and traveled very uh, low budget type of travel around the world mm -hmm. and um, got amazing Camelot interviews for the first uh, really two or three years and then we had a sort of a major disagreement on uh, the various guests we should bring on in the future and then also in terms of Bill became uh, some, somewhat judgmental, I guess you might say, of our whistleblowers. And if they lied to him, which is very common with whistleblowers, mm -hmm. uh, who do try, try to tell the truth, but often are programmed and also having come out of black projects, et cetera, they have to save their own life, so to speak, and they will give you disinfo as well. Okay. And he felt that once they lied to him that he could expose them. But our agreement in Camelot was to protect our whistleblowers. And so we had a major disagreement wow. on that level. Okay. And we did split up in 2009. And since then, I've been running Camelot on my own. Okay. And I, I have a partner who's been with me for about six years uh, doing background things. Uh, Neil Anthony Sanford, he is... Uh, actually a musician by trade, a wonderful musician, uh, but he is ha he learned how to be a filmmaker. And so he also is a to study uh, design in school. And so he designs our banners. And when we do videos on location, which is not very often nowadays, most of my broadcasts are via YouTube. Uh, so I, you know, it's, it's just live over YouTube. Uh, but when I tra ha do travel, like occasion, I, I lead tours in Europe, um, in specifically now in Egypt. And uh, so we film 
Egyptian documentaries in Egypt and he, he does the filmmaking, he's very excellent. And he also, uh, we, we also filmed a small documentary in Turkey when we visited Gobekli Tepe. And, uh, there, and before that I filmed a documentary of Adam's calendar in South Africa. So anyway. So. Uh, I was wondering, can you allude more on to why you have the philosophy of protecting the whistleblower? Oh, well, if you see the, the original Camelot, uh, we, on, if you go to my channel, uh, my, my website, there's a list of channels uh, at the top. There's a menu item that says channels. And you'll see the original uh, projectcamelot.org website that we did in the early days. And this is really in the early days also of the internet. So um, it's a little more rudimentary than the one, the main website, but on there you'll see that we made a pledge, a number of pledges uh, when we first put our project together. What you might call promises to the public and promises to the whistleblowers. Okay. So uh, we, we let them know that we would not reveal their you know, true name and identity and so on and that we would protect them and, and try to uh, make sure their information got out in, in the, the truest form possible and things of that nature. So it was an agreement that we had with whistleblowers around the world. Um, so also in part because this is a very early stages. Now the name whistleblower because of um, Julian Assange and, uh, and Snowden is, is known. But back in those days when we we used to say we specialize in whistleblower testimony because we did. Mm -hmm. And that was whistleblowers from above top secret. And that became our sort of uh, shingle or whatever you want to call it when you, you know, putting, putting that out there. So in order to attract those people, we had to testify to our own honesty and integrity in dealing with them. And, and obviously whistleblowers are afraid for their life. Uh, assuming they're a true whistleblower yeah. and uh, they're also trying to protect their families and you know friends loved ones of all kinds and so this is like the crucial sort of um, centerpiece you might say of, yeah. of an endeavor of this sort when you are dealing with sources as a journalist of course I you have experience with secret sources and there's a there are famous cases of journal journalists um, even having to go to jail to protect their source. So this has a long history, as you may know. I was just curious how you energetically maintained your own neutrality when it came to this type of energy, this information, um, you know, how, how internally you stay balanced and how you, you know, stay even keeled through all of that. I mean, in the beginning, there was no doubt that we wanted to get the truth out. Uh, and so, I've always been a very, um, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, uh, throwing caution to the wind, uh, being able to say what I think. Uh, I became, I've always been notorious in this regard. And even in college, in journalists, you know, articles that I wrote, I did some rather radical things that angered my <laughs> Uh, editor and, and things, because I have just always been a truth teller. I grew up in Northern California, and uh, it was just part of my upbringing, and I've always been fairly outspoken. I even used to talk okay. back to, to the teachers when I was a kid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> cool. So okay. I, it's just, I, um, I had some inner knowing that I came in with, and it's never left me. I have been uh, very psychic and it's protected me and kept me alive. And um, it, it's aided me in my work just incredibly. And it's only grown through the years, uh, especially after I went into meditation uh, during the years when um, I was actually studying directing and acting in New York City and staying in a, a loft where I didn't have to pay rent because it, it was a producer woman produ producer and her husband there at Loft and I, they traveled a lot. So I was able to stay there and I had, um, I, I simply knew about, you know, reaching enlightenment and studied Eastern philosophy and okay. so on when I was younger. So I decided to connect all my chakras and meditate every day to do so. And eventually I did reach multiple levels of Samadhi and, uh, and 
saw the matrix melt, et cetera. And so having Kundalini activation has, you know, probably made my life quite different than other people's. And, uh, and it gives you an inner knowledge and a, um, sort of a, a good firm foundation for what I was to later encounter in Camelot. So okay. you might say that that's where my strength comes from is my spiritual development because I didn't start out uh, exactly focusing on UFOs per se, although I was abducted as a young child and I was aware of other dimensions and other beings all the time. It was just part of my awareness. And uh, so all of that is, is, um, is, is, is why I kind of, I guess this has accompanied me throughout my career. So I, it wasn't something new that happened just because I, I started Project Camelot. It was, it was a foundation that I had from the past. Okay. I, I think that's what I was curious about is just because I know being empathic, being a psychic, being somebody who can you know, read energy that sometimes we can be more vulnerable or more susceptible. And if you were coming into contact with people who are energetically carrying a lot of entanglements, I just didn't know how that transferred onto you, how you cleared your energy, how you, you know, rebalanced and. Um, well, I, I also, you know, I studied lots of, lots of aspects, especially Eastern philosophy. So I, I was well grounded in, in, you know, eating things like health foods early on. My mother, in fact, was a, something of a health nut. And I studied, uh, I don't know, self-reliance and, uh, and was, I, re I read voraciously when I was a child. And I don't know, I was um, you just always an explorer, always willing to push the envelopes. Um, as I say, talking back to teachers, uh, not willing to, sort of um be a good slave uh, here on the planet okay and, uh and coming into this you know i always um i wanted to explore and expand expose secrets that's always my motivation is that humanity has uh in a sense been lied to and lies to itself and each other all the time about reality or the nature of reality and i was very aware of that and decided that I wanted to expose all of that. I wanted to expose the truth of, of who we are really are. And I've always felt a very strong connection to source. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, what okay. can I tell you? I can tell you that when I connected my chakras and reached those Samadhi experiences, it wasn't just reading in a book about it. And a lot of people don't even know what I'm talking about. It's my dog in the background. <laughs> Um, and, and so, uh, her name is Sky. Anyway, um, so I, I was through the Samadhi experiences, anything that might have been theory became very well known to me. And I'm very, I'm an earth sensitive. I can sense uh, portals and wormholes and, and this sort of thing, stargates when I'm in the vicinity of them and so on and so forth. So when you have direct experience, it's very different than if you simply have book knowledge, right? Yeah. So that, that helped a lot and has, you're saying dealing with whistleblowers and their energies and so on. But I, I if you want to expose, uh, I see them as, as souls that go in some cases working on the dark side for maybe even 40 years of their life and then making a soul decision to break out and become a whistleblower is a is a very intense spiritual journey and i regard that highly uh and regard their their courage um so i think they sense when they talk to me that i take them seriously that i take their journey seriously and that i understand on a deep level what it's like to put yourself out there and to be exposed to dangers, possible, you know, threats. I mean, I've been, I'm like the person people love to hate <laughs> on the internet. I get the worst comments and people will tell me this and I, I, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time. What, you know, I, I never spend much time reading comments because I wouldn't have time to do my work and I'm not interested in the negative. Um, 
yeah. perceptions of me. I know who I am and I'm not worried about people uh, sort of trying to expose me as something other than what I am. Uh, people see what they want to see and they often reflect their own inner demons out onto, especially if you become fairly well known. So if you understand that they're seeing what's really inside them, the shit that they carry around, and they're trying to externalize it and sort of put it on you. Mm -hmm. And so that's their issue. It's not my issue. And mm -hmm. so um, knowing that, uh, I also think I understood, um, I worked in Hollywood for 20 years. I worked around stars and uh, all, you know, and people, egotistical people of all kinds. I'm sure. And, um, and I get along really well with these kinds of people because I, I sort of understand it. I don't think there's anything wrong with having a good solid ego. Um, in fact, I think light workers, so-called light workers, it's not a phrase I like, but um, I could prefer the word light warriors, but light worker types um, tend to have weak ego boundaries a lot of times. And so they are easily manipulated and used for the dark. And this is just information I'm aware of. So I think it's, it's, it's better to have a strong ego barrier and a uh, boundary and a sense of boundaries uh, in life. Uh, you know, I think it, it helps the soul in its journey. And otherwise you become kind of porous and uh -huh. you get taken over and, and subject to that sort of thing. So at any rate, having spent all those years in Hollywood and dealing with, um, high level executives and celebrities. I didn't, I, I, I understood it on a deep level. And I think that actually came from a past life uh, of being quite well known. Um, and so, you know. Okay, okay. Who, were, who were you in your past life? Or you said- uh, Actually, you no, know, I'm not gonna say. Okay. I, I will say, um, you know, Project Camelot is based on, on the whole, you know, King Arthur's Camelot. Okay. And there's a lot of talk also, this is not related to me being a celebrity and my uh, one, you know, you have zillions of past lives, or whatever. So, and they, they're, it's only an illusion that they're past because it's sort of simultaneously all time is, and space is, is one. So That's it's- That's Nostradamus speaks of that too. I was reading about some of his literature that he goes into simultaneous time and Dolores Cannon as well. Yeah, and so understanding that it, it's not past per se, but we see it in a timeline. So at any rate, going back to the days of the original Camelot, I, um, I relate very strongly to the princess warrior Guinevere and okay. uh, had past life recall and Bill seemed to me to as, as well as a number of psychics that I, I didn't know when I met him had reported that he might've been King Arthur. And he turns out that he has come from the Arthur bloodline. Okay. So I, it seemed that we had the Arthur Guinevere, whether we were them actually or not, I don't know, but we, we came into Camelot. Uh, that was our inspiration. We, we met and really connected in um, Tintagel that's not where we first met, but we made a journey there on purpose initially. When I went to visit him in England, he agreed to show me the power places, the stone circles, and so on. And the first place we went was Tintagel, one of the ho former homes said to be of King Arthur. So I had past life recall when I was there and have had since then um, very strong indications that of me being Guinevere, let's say. So that Again, I'm sort of not attached to being anyone in particular, but I do know that souls do uh, model themselves on certain, uh, you know, uh, journeys, let's say. And, and that journey of the warrior princess has been very strong with me. And as it happened, um, was the, the, the King Arthur Guinevere relationship uh, ended up to be somewhat similar to Bill and I, and we did break up ultimately and so on. So this is the kind of thing that I am aware of. I'm aware of my past lives and I get information from them in my travels and I travel around the world even now as much as I can, as much as I can afford, uh, which is not as much as I used to be able to. But at any rate, I, whenever I go to a place, I'm a, a or as I say, a sensitive, I can also, um, 
by locate before I go there. I will get downloads about information, or if I go there, I will have very interesting experiences associated with those places. For example, when I went with Ashiana Dean, because I know you're interested in her work, um, I traveled with her and her group at a, several years ago. I think it was it 20, it might have been 2010, but I'm not sure of the year. Maybe it was later than that. At any rate, I began to have uh, get downloads. She, we were riding in a bus and going various places, and she would wait for the guardian races that she downloads information from as a speaker, she calls herself. Uh, and I would start to get the same download that she would then be talking about. So I, I became in touch with them. And I also found that um, I was getting downloads about India and why India is the way she is and why, for example, that it's, it's got garbage everywhere. And, and people, you know, it's, it's such a strange thing because there's so much spiritual awareness in India. And yet at the same time, you see a lot of garbage on the streets, you know, kids playing around in it and everything. Mm -hmm. And the understanding I got was um, I was in touch with the blue uh, Syrian beings who in occupied India in the early days and back in the time of, of Atlantis. And that Atlantis was uh, actually a kind of a worldwide civilization centered um, some of the main areas were in the Atlantic, but they, it spread out. So what happened was uh, in Atlantis, and this seems to be that we are actually revisiting Atlantis at this time in our trajectory. So um, what happened was society split and there were the outliers uh, and the ones who lived in the cities, a little like, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, Hunger Games a little like that scenario. Okay. And so in those times, uh, the rebellion was for the outliers to throw their garbage out to signify that they were not, um, you know, part of the state. And so it became a political statement. And so the people that are now still in India, who are also often souls that have reincarnated and sort of reliving some of the timelines in that way, which one does when we reincarnate, uh, is this connection has, has been sort of part of the history of India now and it, and it became, uh, you know, built into the culture. I think it's probably changing now with the advent of the internet and uh, sort of consciousness of a worldwide that you don't have to sort of live like that. But this is the, I mean, even Egypt has had this tradition as well. So there are reflections of the old relationship between the state and as Atlantis and the outliers. And that that's information that came to me when I was traveling around India with Ashana Dean, uh, among other amazing spiritual type experiences that I had. And, and I just wanted to say thank you for that interview with Ashana. Um, I know it's a three part series. And you can find that on your channel. I was going to leave the links in the description of this video as well. Um, but I think that you have personally, I mean, for me, and I know for so many people have made such a tremendous impact with getting these teachings out and getting them more available, making them more public so people, you know, can find the teachings, you know, um, learn about the Guardians, the Voyager's book, and um, begin to perceive all of this galactic cosmic human history on a higher level intelligence that Ashayana has brought forth. And I think that you had a soul calling through the Guardian Alliance to be a support system of that work. Um, yes, uh, many Camelot people have found her work through me. Uh, so it, it helped also support her work. And I, you know, I have a strong connection to her as well. Uh, for some reason, uh, just, you know, a real familiarity with her. Um, one thing that did happen when I went to India, you know, I get, I'm a precog, I get information ahead of time uh, about things. And I got off the bus just from the airport and her, she and her group were sort of standing there outside a hotel. And I got hit with the fact that, that she was going to be, her, that group was going to be splitting, going through a major split. And that's exactly what happened about nine months later. 
uh, after we got back from India. So I, um, I think I have more questions about that. Um, I did want to know, do, do you personally have a connection with guardians or guardian consciousness? Yes. I, you know, uh, actually I should tell people how I actually came across Ashiana Dean. It was not part of Camelot. It was in the early days, uh, that I was involved in, um, you know, just doing, uh, still working, I think at JPL as a, and, and that's when I came across her website. So the first website was, um, Azurite press, I think.com. I, I don't know if that link's still active, but at any rate, I, um, she had sort of this shield on it that was a certain color and I saw it and I, um, immediately got, um, sort of this knowledge that this was correct. I, I saw this color and it was, um, and her website and, and some symbols there. And I didn't know any, I mean, once now that I've read the books, it's extremely deep and involved yeah. and, um, it's not for the faint of heart, as they say. And it's really like a history of humanity going through the ages and the, the wars of the spiritual wars that have been fought with various CT races all over the planets and, and various uh, genetic. That's exactly, and uh, sorry, that's exactly what I wanted to know was what was, what is your overall perception of the, of the books and um, how do you relate to it and how has it impacted your life, these teachings, once you read the book? Right. Well, uh, what I wanted to say was I got a psychic download the minute I came across the website. And so I, from there, I basically uh, knew, I can't explain it. This happens to me all the time. I get information and I always have, and it just tells me things. And so all I can tell you is that I knew that it was accurate. I knew that it was uh, a group that was unlike anything else on planet earth at the time, that it was much more advanced. So I began to investigate it, you know, the website and, and the information. And I vowed that I would try to interview her uh, at some point in the future. And um, I also eventually, you know, I interviewed her and I, before that I, I, I read the books when you read the books, they are extremely difficult to go through because there's so many new terminologies and mm -hmm. concepts that we're not used to seeing in, in writing really anywhere. And it's, it's extremely advanced in my view. So I, but I get a hit when I'm reading it's, you know, I simply know if something's true or if it's not. And I got a very strong hit that the information was correct, that it was, um, you know, like a kind of like a gold mine of information about humanity and spiritual wars, as I say, going back millennia uh, into, you know, in, in an interstellar sense. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it just rang true. That's all I can tell you. I, um, and gradually it seeped in because when you read the books, you realize you're not going to get it all in one take. You can read the words, but there's so much there that it takes a long time to kind of filter through. But I and, and learn an entirely new vocabulary. <laughs> and so I can't say that I am an expert on those books either. Um, still, the knowledge in some areas has eluded me simply because I know it's there, but there's it's just too much. You know, it's it's just it's extremely dense. And so, uh, and I don't go to, uh, I don't attend her, uh, you know, seminars and she gives seminars on a regular basis, but I've never, uh, had the money to actually attend. And, um, for some reason, you know, it's, it's something that I, I focus on my work as opposed to her work, but I, I do recommend her work everywhere I go. And we have a standing invitation for her to come back and be interviewed again. I'm pretty much at at a, as of a certain date, I became the only journalist that interviewed her. And that's true today as well. So it was an honor to interview her. And, she, you know, the, the interviews speak for themselves. Either the knowledge will resonate with you or it won't. Um, she talks about uh, certain races that have made uh, decisions to go against humanity in negative ways. 
And then it involves certain uh, large groups that contain uh, what we call um, sort of uh, res resistance in a negative way to, uh, let's say, the, the law of the one, et cetera. And that includes, you know, the Ashtar Command, for example, uh, the, and also Metatron um, and so on. So some people think they're downloading information from Ashtar and from Metatron and all this kind of stuff. And it's not, you know, they are real. The Ashtar Command has a huge base underground camp, California and Arizona in that area, et cetera. So all I can say is that when I look at her material, when I hear the information or read the information, I know, and this is true of all the material I come across, I can tell if something's true or not. It just either resonates or it doesn't. And sometimes I'll get a hit and I'll think, well, that's just crazy. Why can't I, you know, take this on board, whatever it is? Why is it hitting me wrong? But it does. And then I often almost... Immediately. They'll find out like, you know, weeks or months later that indeed I was right, that there was a reason why my, you know, myself was resisting the information. And, um, and I can't explain when that happens. I can't even explain uh, necessarily why, but I get a very strong, you know, take on it. And for example, when I heard the information she put out about Metatron, I immediately knew that it was correct. And I immediately uh, also, since then, I've also got a very strong take on it being an artificial intelligence. And it's linked to this, um, oh God, what's his name? Enoch, uh, initially, uh, which was a, like a human being that the so-called gods found favor on with. And, and if you look in the Bible and so on, you'll see that Enoch was basically found favor with the Anunnaki. And it's the Anunnaki that were the so-called gods that found favor with Enoch. So he was already working on a questionable side way back then. And, you know, some people like to think he's some kind of, um, I don't know, specially selected human or something. And unfortunately, you know, this is all a problem. Uh, but at any rate, these are the kinds of things I'm talking about where you get a, a I can get a hit on something that will tell me basically sort of like the hard information in the background. And then from then on, I sort of track it and pay attention and try to learn what it is, is really the problem in, inside of the situation. So it's, it's fairly complex, but everyone has these, uh, See, truth resonates. There's just no two ways about it. Yeah. For example, it gives it can give you chills if you hear truth, yeah. and, uh, and and so we are uh, like barometers of truth. We can we either choose to um, make truth our sort of banner and our beacon, or we actually choose to to lie and and become what you may say is disinfo agents, and this is a conscious decision. Uh, although it can be influenced by a lot of factors and, and beings around us and so on and so forth. Can I ask you, um, do you have advice for people coming through spirituality who um, may have unknowingly identified with Metatron or these other angels and these other systems and have used this as a part of their spiritual evolution, but then may have came into some of these other teachings, like such as the Voyagers, and then learned about the 55 Metatronic um, and you know, how then do they then begin to look at their belief systems and their spirituality and, and how they identify with these spirits and these angels and you know, how can one incorporate these teachings? Um, does this mean we have to abandon, you know, um, certain beliefs to, you know, having connections to these particular angels that we may have once thought to believe as being good beings or not fallen. Um, so how, how does one continue to, I guess, develop in the teachings um, according to the, the new information, I guess, that came out about Metatron? Sure. Uh, well, that is a dilemma for people. I think that um, now this is 
this is information that came to me through uh, what is called the wing makers. And James, uh, the initial uh, sort of person who downloaded the information about wing makers, uh, calls himself, he's from Lyra, and he had talked about there being, just like we know there's a matrix. Well, there is a matrix and you can visualize the earth as having like rivers of information around it. And even one of our witnesses, Pete Peterson said the scientific, in the black scientific community, um, meaning the hidden scientific community, con considers all of this, what we call the ether as uh, an information field. So there are rivers of like matri uh, matrixes going uh, around the earth. And one of those contains uh, channeled information. So initially, a lot of channelers do nothing other than tap into that river of information. So they get, a, they, there's a churn, you can appreciate that. There's like a churn and all of that stuff keeps going around every eon, you know, and, and getting regurgitated, so to speak in various forms and fashions, but nonetheless, you know, because we're each, each of us is a filter. So we filter through what we are able to, and we also can, uh, uh, you know, it can be have a clear channel or not a clear channel, and most people are not that clear. So they will put their own overlay into the situation. And they are yeah. also, Ashiana Dean cautions against channeling because there's a very large ch chance uh, of takeover in that situation, even sort of a temporary you know, where the, where the person will become easily taken over, even for short periods of time. So this is the kind of thing where um, spiritual, uh, it, it's really learning discernment on a spiritual level. It's a, it's a journey, all of it's a journey, and you become sort of better adept and better equipped to deal with it as you move through your incarnations. And so what I would say is that people that have kind of gone down certain spiritual paths initially, I mean, you can also just take regular spirituality, whether it be, you know, being a Muslim or a Christian or, you know, Judeus Christian, Judea Christian, Christian or whatever. In other words, there are lots of lies that have been put out within the, the confines of so-called spirituality and or religion. So this is part of the problem. And within that, there has been takeover within those groups that have pushed forward certain information that contains lies and has contained lies over and over again, but never been sort of revealed. So these are the kinds of things that we're dealing with here on earth is, is a, a, you know, it's kind of like a soup of, of spiritual information and people have to make their way through it. So do, do you um, feel that there is any purity still to the metatronic spirit or the metatronic angel or do you think that it is um fully taken over fully infiltrated and is a fallen fallen being or, uh, or do you think that the river is just i think that the i think from what i understand and my um take on it you see even the name metatron think about that it sounds like an ai it's an ai at this point it's not a being and there's a problem also i think in a certain sense that we don't know the difference between uh artificial intelligence and actually uh what we are and so we can be deceived very easily and it's kind of like battlestar galactica mm -hmm. um yeah and and some of these some of the initial uh, beings like let's go back to enoch let's say there may have been a soul there okay and he may have moved on and have nothing to do with metatron at any rate even now on the other hand he could still be somewhere in the background but he's been taken over by ai so it i i just all i know is that in my view metatron is you could call angels could be AI. They're light beings or they're manifesting a form of light, but it may be artificial, a certain kind of, it doesn't have the density and the clarity of, of real, um, you know, spiritual light. So it's, it's a deception, a form of deception. And it's, it's understandable. You know, uh, one of the ways these P 
people think the negative parades itself as negative, but it doesn't. The negative parades itself as light. It parades itself as good, you know, as, um, you know, healing the sick and saving the earth. Except they don't tell you they're, you know, that they're doing this in a manipulative kind of way in order to serve their own agenda, okay? And to see, you know, humans are, um, can be treated like children, even though we're not. We are actually, especially um, the, the souls that inhabit these bodies are actually, if they come into full spiritual knowledge, will find themselves to be highly elevated spiritual beings with, you know, access yeah. to eternal life. But the, the um, sort of vessels that are down here, a lot of times have sort of cut themselves off. Um, and I liken it to, uh, Ashana Dean says we have a, a minimum of 12 incarnations and it, it's actually multiples of that, but nonetheless, so it's, it's more than that. But what I would use is like the human hand. So if you imagine that every finger is an incarnation and they're all simultaneous and that it, there is, there's a channel. So it goes up, like use the arm for your connection, the, that connection to source and then source being the avatar, like a man, imagine your body is the avatar. So it's this kind of thing where a finger doesn't necessarily have, it could, you can, certain frequency fences can be put in to block your connection to source in, in some ways. And it, it, it goes through um, a certain spiritual darkness, you might say, at that time. So all of this gets... Do you gets think that the spiritual, finding the spiritual darkness is a continuous process to coming back to the purity and coming back to the light? That... Well, I think it, that, you know, each, in it, as I say, each vessel, so your, your vessel is, has access at all times to the light. It's connected. We're all directly connected to source. But it certain uh you know blocks uh mind control what they say is Im implants both both physical and non-physical implants um what they call memes ideas that that take on a life of their own that then block spiritual progress uh some of the chakras getting uh sort of what we say muddied and dirtied and uh and 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 action can so because every action you take will reflect back on your on your physical um, and spiritual development and can create uh, blockages just like you know impurities in the system in your biology so the blockages are what become the problem and some people you know it's kind of like it twists the person so you to avoid a blockage you might get the person going around it uh, rather than burning through it so they're they're bent in a sense okay. they, you know yeah. in a spiritual sense and so That's a good analogy yeah it's it's just it's a matter of and and how do you get rid of these is you go into meditation uh you you, you know you can learn to raise the kundalini energy which is light energy it's it's really orgone and every human body contains it uh when People are young as children and as teenagers, they have a lot of orgone. Obviously, as they get older, a lot of times they lose that. And that's why they, they age and, and their skin gets all dried out and all this kind of stuff is the orgone. It's all orgone. So um, they, they no longer have what orgone is, is from spin. Okay, so it's, a, it's how you spin and how much you, you're, you're, you're spinning you're in, in a state of spin. So like your particle rotation or like your Merkaba field? How, how it's, I, you know, like, the Merkaba is a, is, a, is a sort of a side effect of the natural uh, sort of spin of all our cells. And, and so everything in the universe is spinning. The spiral, I believe, is the basis, uh, the basic sort of unit uh, depicting in the universe and also our bodies, etc. So all of this has to do with how you cleanse, go through a cleansing process is to go back into your vessel and to start to use that spin to understand this, the, the correct way, you know, clockwise for the, the spin of the chakras to clear them uh, out and, and then begin to be able to reconnect fully with source instead of just partially or 
and to burn through the, the sort of areas where you have blockages, which is exactly what happens. The light will burn through those blockages when you're sitting in meditation eventually and you will feel this uh, go on. So I, um, I, I know that this is not known in Western society. In East, on the East, it's commonplace. It's, it's very well understood. Of course, yogis have been doing this for centuries, etc. But not all yogis are also, um, they're not pure spiritual beings just because they follow this path. They are still beings in development. So many of them have distorted in their own ways some of this information. And it became a kind of a secret society this knowledge is secret knowledge um, and so on. So uh, th this is, so all I can tell you is in terms of understanding where you're getting the information and whether or not it's actually coming to you in a pure sense, whether you're being manipulated by it and how you might be manipulated or deceived by it and so on. It takes a long time to develop clear spiritual sight and insight. So it's a journey each of us goes on. And don't forget that also, in a sense, our karmic history will inter interfere with and or create blockages. So if you don't have, let's say somebody lies to their spouse and lies to um, other people on a regular basis, that's creating a block, a dark, a dark area in, in their sort of aura and so on and eventually can cause disease etc so the, yeah this is, um, so how do you think one discerns their connection to pure source consciousness pure light in simultaneous to the law of one and all and simultaneous to guardian consciousness and how do we discern that we're connecting to the purest purest form of, of God consciousness, prime creator consciousness, cosmic mind, you know, and discern. Uh, well, again, I think it, it, it's through trial and error um, is how the human being lists, you know, learns. And so inevitably, let's say um, most of us have fallen in love with a person that we eventually found out was nothing like we thought they were, for example. Let's just use that as a very practical example. So the same way a person falls in love with a religion, that's not really what they think it is. Mm -hmm. So these are the kinds of things, these forms of Maya, as they say, to, that we become deceived by. And there are proclivities within us that are sort of reaching out for the light in that way, but can be deceived also by the darkness that's parading as light and the light that, that may be hidden behind the darkness and so this is the kind of thing where eventually you learn eventually you you know the person gets outed or they do something that tells you they are not on the they're not working on the side of the light at that point you have a decision to make you can either join them in in their sort of work on the dark side mm -hmm. or you can you know separate yourself and 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 you know decide to follow the light it's, it's a decision we make every day. Um, every single day, there's, there's things that we're faced with, like that we, our soul, have allowed into our midst to challenge us to, say, to make that decision again as to whether we want to follow the light in that particular instance or through maybe fear or prior triggering and uh, PTSD or whatever the block happens to be, we may shirk our responsibility as a spiritual being in that way whatever it happens to be it, you know and um it's kind of like recently the death of this uh wonderful thriller no novelist uh jennifer james she was exposing through her novel i mean in so-called fiction but she did some very good research uh, what the drug companies are up to with these immuno, immunoceuticals and, uh, and the fact that they also have put into them things like aluminum that, that allows this stuff to get in through, to cross what they call the blood brain barrier. And so they're doing it, they're, they're trying to get humans to uh, sign up for this stuff to get vaccines, to get their children vaccinated against 
what immune, immunoceuticals is all about preventative medicine, supposedly. So it sounds kind of good, right? But mm -hmm. in reality, they're, they're being shot up with, with all kinds of stuff. And this is part of the, the move to, uh, for transhumanism here on, on planet Earth, et cetera, which these parents don't know and they're all in naive about. But nonetheless, children get sick and die. And the way the Illuminati view this is that, in a sense, it's a tracking system. If your child cannot withstand this, this uh, inoculation that they give them, it tells them that their genetics are faulty and they aren't strong enough. And because, you know, from the point of view of the Illuminati, it's might makes right always. It's always, you know, only the strong survive. That's, those are the, their creed. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. They worship themselves. So this, is, uh, this is, 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 is what goes on. So people are deceived uh, along these lines. But it's, what's interesting is how people, even in my sector, my so-called colleagues, don't see these connections to the sort of, um, you know, you might say the sort of spiritual, the ET, the, the realms that we deal with. They think, oh, UFOs are over here and health and, you know, is over here. When in reality, the super soldier thing is right in the middle and they could be dealing with this. They could be protesting, you know, the death. She was killed with two shots to the head, it is said. And that is an exact mirror of what she wrote in, in her plot line of what happened to one of her characters kind of thing, um, it's the way she was killed. So obviously it's a targeted hit, but you know, no, very few people have the guts to come out and say so, which I have done. And at the moment, it looks like the police and, and her loved ones are being kept quiet on these scores, but they must be probably scared to death to say anything because they don't want to die either. So these are spiritual dilemmas that we're faced with every day, you know, that we have to make a decision. Should we speak out? Should we speak on behalf of the light? Should we expose the darkness or should we keep quiet in fear and kind of cower in the corner and not be true to our true selves? These kinds of dis dilemmas, and maybe we're trying to protect our children, which is our first priority. Understandably, I'm not saying they're simple decisions to make. I'm just saying these are the kinds of roadblocks that we encounter that we have to push through and when you do push through and and you know we all know courageous stories about and certainly about certain whistleblowers who came out and told the truth against all odds you know and still managed to survive there is also a large portion of the positive beings that will protect you uh, to some degree, but you also have to protect yourself and so on. So these are decisions we all have to make. It, it got me thinking about, about um, seeking truth and, and being, um, so, you know, I followed um, Ashana's teachings. I've read the Voyagers 2. I've never read Voyagers 1. Um, I've read the Bio-Spiritual Healing textbooks 1, 2, and 3, and um, Angelic Realities, and I support her work. I love her work. Um, but even though I think she has put out some recent teachings, I think a lot of people within the community, like uh, the Asha and Adeem groups and stuff on Facebook and stuff, are curious as to if she's gone into, if she's in hiding, if she, if, um, I guess everybody's kind of curious, like, where is Asha and Adeem and what's happening to her? Is she writing another book? Some people feel that maybe she dematerialized and transfigured into eternal atoms and she's gone off planet. She's gone through the, the gates and, um, or is she, um, I guess we're just curious if she's still okay, if she's okay. I'm, I don't understand why they're curious and they don't know that she has a website and she does regular, um, I, I, every few months she comes out and does a whole presentation. Uh, it does cost money. It cost, I think, if I recall, it's something like $144 a session. So uh, she does everything online nowadays. So she's there. Um, she's, you know, any of her su subscribers can, can watch and see her in real life <laughs> online. So she's very active. Um, she works very, very hard. She's still downloading, constantly downloading information from the Guardians and putting it out there. So she's very much alive and well. Okay. And um, what can I tell you? I, I don't know. You know, um, you know, if she's writing um, another 
sequel or another book? I don't or? think so. I don't know that for sure, but um, my understanding is, you know, that in a sense, she's writing a book, but it's through the seminars. So all of the seminars are transcribed and recorded as, as I think, video and audio. You can also purchase them after they're done. So you, her, her website, um, I have everything linked on my, my site. Um, in fact, if you go to the, my, the front page of Camelot and you scroll down to the Voyager 2 book and click on that, you will go directly to her R High Yes website. And that is where you can sort of um, go around and, and, you know, register for her okay. seminars, et cetera. I mean, I was in touch with her, I don't know, maybe it was a year ago or so, in which okay. I, you know, she did say sometime in the future, we're gonna get together again. So, uh, you know, but it's, it, it's in guard, as she said, <laughs> she may say, yeah. it's in guardian time, you know, so it, I don't, I figure that at the right time she'll come forward. I know that part of the way she's protected because the knowledge is so profound. Yeah. It contains major science that goes against uh, every major, you know, scientist and drug company. And, you know, she puts out who the enemies are. I mean, the books contain the truth. And she also, when she speaks in her seminars, is telling the truth. And so this is a threat to the powers that be, but because she, it's kind of couched behind a lot of layers to where, just as you say, these people have a Facebook page and don't even know she has a website. I well, mean, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to contact you is because I've been seeing so much separation in like the Ashayana community on line like on Facebook on Instagram you know um it's there's like rumors that are spread I mean I've come across so much false information and people saying that she's not even a speaker anymore I've heard people say that speaker two was infiltrated um that well, the other speakers that, that 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 said, like I said there was a major split in her organization and so there were two people one is her uh, ex-husband and one is this, um, this other woman that considered herself a speaker. Um, and they split off together. And that was back when I say, I, just after we came back from India. So that is a huge lawsuit that she had to be also very quiet about and wasn't going public. I don't, as I say, I don't take her seminars, so I don't know the details as to how that all played out, the lawsuit. I know it was years ago. So at this point, um, that organization, that kind of split, I believe went off and, and started trying to do their own thing. I haven't followed them either, so I couldn't tell you the status on their situation. I can tell you that people go on the, <laughs> people have whole shows lying about me. So I can totally understand that people are probably doing similar things with her yeah. and not understanding. Um, now, why this happens is their own spiritual journey. So they, you know, look, if you're not sort of, you, you want to know what's going on with her, then take a seminar. <laughs> Hello. You yeah. know, it's, it's not hard, right? It's, it's like the people that... Um, I had a very interesting hap thing happen over Thanksgiving when a person told me they didn't want to be associated with my website and my work and not realizing that I am my work. So why would you want to associate with, you know, me if you don't want to associate with my, my work? In other words, I, it's not like I'm an employee that goes to work every day and can say I work for, you know, Monsanto or some stupid thing. And, and it's not me, right? I'm innocent. It's yeah. my work is me, you know, and so in her sense, you know, her work is her and, uh, and, 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 I, and I, I totally agree with that because I see people like separating it and then claiming ownership over it too. And, um, yeah. and not being able to, you know, make that connection back together again. And, it, um, it's, yeah, it's deciphering and discerning through a lot of this and just staying connected to the source is what seems to be the most important thing. If you are a true supporter, a true fan, and you true, truly believe in the teachings. You know, it's, and it's also keep in mind that it's not a matter of belief because ultimately it's got to be knowing. 
you have to reach beyond belief. Uh, I know that's a common terminology, but ultimately it's, it, you know, we're staking our lives on it. If you can think about it that way. Um, if there, see, I, you know, I, I write and talk about this, but in essence, it's all fine and good to say there are lots of positive ETs, but if we have even a few negative ETs that are trying to kill us, eat our children, you know, mm -hmm. abduct our children, abduct us, do various things to us, then it, it behooves us to warn each other and to be aware of it. And if you want to ignore that and think that you're doing anyone a favor, it's kind of like being in Nazi Germany and pretending that the camps don't exist. You know, you're part of the problem, ultimately, if you cannot come out and um, tell the truth about what's really going on. So it's, it, it is a problem. Uh, I think that people have to connect on a certain level where it, it, it really, you know it in, I don't know, in your gut, in your bones, whatever, um, to where it's, it becomes a knowing. And what, that's a long journey. Uh, but it's not that hard. And I think in a certain sense that if, if she never did another thing, the, the, the book, the knowledge the guardians have put into the books through her is, is so much superior to anything that anyone knows about humanity and the wars with the various races on and off planet, um, that that would be sufficient and people have to make their way through that and i think the problem is that you know it is a problem that it's quite esoteric it's difficult knowledge to to delve into to understand um you know and and so on so but it's not impossible okay and it isn't necessary i don't think to learn all the lingo so to speak on a certain level you you know if you understand the word grok if you can grok it, you, it, it will become part of you. You already are, you're connected. We're, you know, we learn through osmosis. Humans, I mean, there's a lot of misinformation um, about how humans learn and who we really are and what we're kind of, but we are senders and receivers. So we can get information. And in some cases, you don't have to read a book to have the information come to you. It just comes through, you know, in essence, the field yeah. that you're exposed to, the, the beings that walk, could walk into a room and say nothing, and you're exuding the information, and other people can telepathically download that information. So we are connected, and this connection is very powerful and can be tapped into uh, in order to solve your spiritual dilemmas, etc. And, you know, the universe any self-respecting witch or warlock, which I consider we're all magicians, witches and warlocks, um, can, can see the signs and read the signs that come to you in the universe and the universe talks to you. And so it's through that dialogue, that interchange between you and, and the universe or all that is that it, you're, you're staying that, keeping that connection alive and you're getting the information. So you get validation and it comes, sometimes it comes very quietly. Um, it's not like you can shout it on a mountaintop because no one will know what you're talking about. You know, it can be the, the smallest sign or of, of acknowledgement or um, affirmation you know, or, or actually information telling you the real truth about something you thought was wonderful, you know, that it's not so wonderful or whatever it happens. To yeah. Be. Yeah. You know, so yeah, it's, it's, it resonates again, you know, and, and we are, we, we have all the antenna, everything that's built into this, this sort of um, body mind complex has the ability to, to take it in and discern and figure out, you know, what to do with the information, et cetera. Um, I had a question too. What is your position with Lisa Renee and are you current with any of her teachings and how do you feel about her work and information she's brought forth? Um, I guess, I don't know if you want to compare them, compare the two platforms or, um, or is one is, is Ashiana's teachings the founding of that teaching? Cause I, I believe Lisa Renee has her own relationship with the guardian. So she's brought forth her own teaching. So I just wanted to get your intake on that entire picture. Um, 
you know, I, I don't follow her, her stuff. Uh, I did hear about her, I think in the early days when she first came out as some of it being derivative of the, of the work of Ashana Dean. And I think they had an issue with that um, sort of copyright type things. I don't know whether that was an accurate depiction or whether, you know, again, if we live in an information field that we can all access, then those of us will begin to be in touch with the guardians. And as I say, I'm sure I am. And the guardians are a group of races, by the way. So, and they don't agree on everything. So different race groupings within the guardians could say, um, be more in communication with certain individuals over others and so on, maybe going on. I can't, you know, sort of, say with regard to Lisa Renee what her story is because I don't follow her work so I I don't know I I know of her um, but I don't think I've ever been in dialogue with her to my knowledge and I I simply you know if if something again if something someone is, is doing something and tapping into something that resonates then um, obviously you're gonna go with it it's it's all for each and every one of us to decide um, I have many colleagues that talk about similar things to the things I talk about. We're all in the same, you know, sort of sector talking about the secret space program and, and secret government, et cetera. And we each may be tapping into different aspects of that. You know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. I've noticed that, um, within my colleagues, many of them hold back and are um, not as um, spiritually ad adventurous, at, let's say, as I am. Uh, they're not as uh, interested in putting them their own lives on the line necessarily, or they may, you know, have sort of a different take and be, uh, uh, you know, kind of caught up in their own drama, whatever it happens to be. But it, it's, it's not, you know, we're all our own spiritual leader, we're all our own guru, if you want to call it that. I'm not trying to be anybody's guru, yeah. and I don't think she is either. It's the races. Uh, you know, I don't put races, other races, on a pedestal either. Um, this is another important aspect. I don't believe in worshiping other beings. I don't even believe that uh, that the the various, you know, because some, some race has advanced technology that they somehow have advanced spirituality. They don't go hand in hand necessarily. There's a lot going on out there. And yeah. so, as I say, uh, it, it's kind of a big story, but the only way to navigate through it is to, you know, listen to what you're drawn to listen to, um, follow what you're drawn to follow, um, do your own investigations, do your own research, see what resonates and then go with it. And it doesn't mean you're gonna be right all the time. You know, you may be wrong and you may be very wrong, uh, but that will be a learning process. So, you know, in a sense, it's almost better to be wrong than right because being here on earth is about the experience of it, of going through something in a sense and discovering what's wrong with it um, before you kind of come into the light. Yeah, so every and time sometimes you need that life. wisdom and experience to actually sometimes create something that was going to even be more than you ever expected or. Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's room for, th for that. You know, there's room for mm -hmm. amazing, expanding, mind expanding experiences. But a lot of the people, you know, a whistleblower, for example, is a person who has a uh, actually gone through something that was negative uh, in its, um, in many aspects of it, but the ultimate no you know, knowledge was, was impartial. You know, it, it was uh, simply maybe free energy, your motivation for getting involved in the secret government, for example. And so I, I talked to um, sources and, and recently had a discussion with a man who, has some brilliant ideas, he believes, uh, having to do with drones and um, the kind of surveillance they're capable of and, and how you can multiply the drones and, you know, and, and turn, them, turn them into swarms and all of this part of, I, I understand that Elon Musk wants to do something like this too. So, you know, they, 
the mind, the human mind is saying of, of the scientists, oh, we can do this, but should you do it? And is it gonna benefit humanity? That's the question. So they often don't make that latter step. They just stay back in falling in love with the technology, not worried about what it's gonna do to the quality of life here on earth for planet, for other members of humanity and our spiritual progress. So these are the issues that have to be looked at. It's not just doing something because you can. And that's the journey again, the journey. That's why I think whistleblowers are so important because they're often people that have taken that journey and have come to the conclusion that what they were involved in, and sometimes it's a terrible, you know, um, burden, if you want to say, on a spiritual level that they've been involved. Once you realize what you've been part of, um, some people can't handle that, that the weight of that, you know, can, can't forgive themselves, get out from under that even whistleblowing is not sufficient. You know what I mean? So it's, it's this kind of thing. When you know a secret that could benefit your fellow human and you keep it quiet, you know, for 40 or more years, you know, and then you realize that you could have saved lives if you spoke out. That's a huge spiritual burden. And sure, yeah. there are mitigating factors having to do with maybe you wouldn't have survived if you spoke out. Maybe your family wouldn't have survived. There's all these, you know, factors. But this is the journey. And so that's why I think whistleblower testimony is so vital and why to this day um, I do my best to expose uh, things along those lines. Mm -hmm. Although true whistleblowers at this point are very far and few between because the state has, and I mean, you know, the state of the really governance of this planet has so clamped down and they used Assange and they use um, Snowden as examples. It doesn't mean they're the most perfect whistleblowers, but they certainly exposed a certain amount of truth to the public and have paid a price. So um, this is the kind mm -hmm. of thing that goes on. Yes, I feel like you're very much speaking to my soul today. <laughs> I keep feeling like the constant goal, so I hear this from a lot of people, should be just getting the ascension codes up as high as possible in the DNA um, because you want to attain that cellular memory. So if you do have to reincarnate, you have more cellular memory when you come back through. So I don't know if that should be the goal. I, I hear a lot of people saying that, you know, they don't want to reincarnate. They, want, they just want to get off planet. They want to enter out of the, the cycles. Do, do you feel we have a choice in reincarnation? Um, do you feel we have a choice in being intruded or mutated? Um, do you feel um, free will can protect us from greater collective designs? Um, yes. In answer to those questions, I mean, we definitely have free will. That's what this sector is about. Um, but there are decisions that we make, as I said, I was kind of talking about before every day that can influence our standing with regard to that sort of dilemma. And so you, in a sense, you're choosing whether you know you're choosing or not. And, and those choices are, again, made in small ways in every day. And that will affect your frequency, right? And, and so in a sense, your spiritual imprint on this reality. And it, it's like baggage you carry with you. So as you go, you're going to, um, to reflect that. And I think, yes, of course, uh, ascension is a process. I call it a journey. It's not a destination. I, I think that's really important for people to realize and this idea of uh, you know rising up through the various dimensions and densities and leaving this planet um i i sort of have a, a different philosophy about it i consider myself what you call a bodhisattva which is a being that reached enlightenment but has had had sort of put it on the back burner to come back and, and serve humanity again and so whether that that's true of my case or not doesn't really matter, but it's a philosophy I have. So the idea being that, it, is it enough to enlighten yourself, for example? Is it all about self? Is it not 
as important to see the rest of humanity reach that level of enlightenment, whatever it happened to be, and, and going even beyond that. In other words, we're in this together and we will uh, all reach you know, various stages of enlightenment and progress. That kind of goes with the territory. And if time is an illusion, it, an illusion, then you can appreciate that how, how soon you reach it, it's not, you know, it's, it's not, um, it's not a race. And there are, a lot a race of races. <laughs> there are a lot of spiritual materialists that uh, think they want to get off this planet because they want to go do something else. But in reality, what are you going to go do? You know, you're going to end up serving another dimension in another sector with your light, assuming you have a light to, to contribute. So it's, it's not so different, if, if you understand. So I, I'm always a bit um, skeptical of people that tell me, oh, you know, I'm making sure this is my last incarnation here on this horrible prison planet because- Yeah, all the time, all yeah, the time. I know, but, but again, this is spiritual, what we call spiritual materialism. It's missing the point. When you're serving and you, you do something loving and wonderful and you feel it and the other being feels it and you do something to contribute to raising the consciousness of this planet, it's just as valuable as raising the consciousness on Mars or raising the consciousness on, you know, Jupiter or, or you know, Alpha Centauri or, you know, going up the dimensions and, you know, all this nonsense. I mean, it doesn't, I don't know. It, it's, you know, um, perfection is a really boring destination, for example, in my opinion. Uh, it's not about that. It's really about the journey. And I think that we can contribute anywhere we are. And I think that kind of knowledge and that kind of peace, if you will, inner peace and outer peace um, with that notion is, is more important. Um, if you think that a human being is less valuable, for example, to, to help than uh, some, I don't know, demented spider being on another planet, then, you know, that's your journey, I suppose. But in, in essence, to me, it doesn't, it doesn't carry a lot of meaning. And I, I could care less when people want to talk about, you know, ascended masters, etc. I mean, we're all again, if all time and space are simultaneous, and I say this, and I, you know, I, I don't understand, I don't, people don't say this, but you see, it's kind of like, I see this as in a sense of video game. We are already enlightened. We are already there. We couldn't ever get there if we weren't already there. You can't be an internal soul some of the time and not others. You're either always eternal or you're not eternal. So if you're always eternal, then you've been there and you've done that and you are eternal. So we are in a state of play here on planet earth where we are experiencing this in, in a, in a sort of a, a, a game, a drawn out scenario in which we are examining the journey and that's all it's about. And we're beings in a state of play. And one of my witnesses, uh, Captain Mark Richards, who I've interviewed now 11 times in, in a California prison, who was framed for a murder he didn't commit, uh, he, uh, he talks about how he's, he's very aware and uh, enlightened in, in many ways, individual. And he talks about how the different beings are in different places and, and times and so on. And I, I think that, that this understanding, sort of having a deep spiritual understanding of who we are now and who we will, in essence, always be, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's much more a form of enlightenment than anybody who is wondering about climbing some ladder and trying to make a destination and trying to go talk to, you know, some, it, putting, you know, sort of, ascended masters or other avatars and so on, on some kind of spiritual ladder in which, you know, they, they talk to them like they're Hollywood stars or something. Who cares? I mean, we're all the same. We're all one with source. So it's not, yes. it's not about that. Yeah. I really feel that. Um, do, do you think, 
Okay, so I just, I'll switch it up a little bit. I'm curious about gate sites and stuff too. Okay. Do you have any current information as far as um, grid sites, um, as uh, you know, overall understanding of where the energy is with any of the grid sites or any new current information or intel that you could give us as far as the Stargate sites? In your interview with Ashana Dean, you seemed very interested towards the end about the gate sites and wanting to find out which ones were fallen and which ones were or um, taken over or if you want to allude on that at all. Well, the, yes, the Stargates, I mean, the major Stargates, a lot of them were taken over and there are um, back, I don't even know the terminology, but there are subs, sub gates. And in fact, when we were in India, we created a gate. Uh, actually more than one and so and humans can create stargates and wormholes and but by, by using the vortex energy in certain places so you know um, yes there are many wars over these gates and the war in Iraq and Iran uh, is about that uh, and Syria has to do with uh, the stargates and... Have you heard of the five goddess stargate, the pentagram in Syria? Um, not per se, but I, I do want to say that in Oshima's book, and I, I don't know which one it is, I think it's probably volume two, There, she, she actually at the back of the book tells you the names of all the gates and all the designations and, and you know, what are called the A-pins, uh, you know, the... Um, all of this stuff, okay? So that you can you can track these various things. So in a sense, what you're gonna have to do in the future is to see, again, what resonates with your frequency. So it's kind of immaterial whether a gate is open or closed if it doesn't relate to you. Because if you can't access it, then it's, it's not gonna mean anything. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You won't go through it. And if you can, then you'll know it. Um, for example, I, I go to certain places and I know there is a gate there and I know that I have access um, and I can feel it because you can feel it. it it's, it's physical as well, well as me metaphysical or whatever. So uh, for example, there are vortexes in Sedona. This is a sort of on, on a bit or more remedial level. Um, and I, one of the vortexes is that called the female vortex, it's cathedral vortex. And I can go there and feel myself being pulled into it. So there's a resonance there, but someone else could go there and just, you know, have a nice day. Yeah. <laughs> it's not meaningful. So it's kind of like worrying about something that may not affect you ever. And uh, I do believe she probably keeps people posted as to the status of the gates and whether one gets taken over or whether they've brought, they've been able to take it back. But this is to me, see that information would be the challenges for me to actually access that on my own. I don't, I don't need to be told, you know, such and such a gate in China is open or closed. You know, it, it's, it's interesting intellectually, but what I'm saying is it's not going to have any real meaning. Uh, now, if I want to go there and I want to access it, then I'll find out. And that's one of the reasons I travel. In fact, I encourage people to meditate in what we call, you know, spiritually very um, intense grid activated areas, because you will know if you tap into that energy in that place, you know, where the, where that particular gate energy is. So you can read in the back of her book where they all are and see where they are on the planet. I can also say that um, new gates can, as I say, new, new gates, new wormholes also can be created. And our military, of course, is working on doing that in various places and preventing people from accessing gates in other places and so on. So Yes, uh, wars over stargates, is, it's major. And, you know, of course, Egypt is full of uh, stargates and portals. And you can, I take a tour there too. And we, we do sort of, I bring people to various areas that have been activated. And, and the energies do change. And actually, that you know, just like in, in Sedona, people will know that some of those 
uh, vortexes have moved. Sometimes they just simply move and sometimes they actually seem, seem to kind of shut down um, and, and, and that can happen too. I was kind of asking too, because I was wondering if there, you know, if there was a higher universal structure with the gates opening and closing that would affect us more of on a collective energy. Like well, there's this, you know, the sphere of, of Amente, um, the halls of Amente, as they call them, all of that having to do with uh, what she talks about a lot in the books, and I assume she's talking about it now, having to do with the major gates to do with ascension and going off planet and out uh, a certain sort of trajectory um, has had been activated and were opened. And after 2012, that, that was clear that, and they, they are open through, um, she says, or the guardians had said through 2022. So they're open, permanently open at this point. And there's this thing called the bridge, uh, which in, in which this has been constructed so that we can go beyond some of the, um, in, what she calls intruder races, having put, uh, close certain gates and taking them over, et cetera. So, so this does go on. Um, I think, you know, it's the same thing with having to do with, you know, can you progress as a soul or are you going to be locked into this matrix, this earth-like matrix and have to reincarnate if you don't want to, supposedly, if yeah. that conscious mind thinks you don't want to. Yeah. So it has again to do with this same idea in my, the way, you know, on the one hand, I listen to the guardians and I listen to Ashana Dean, but I, I bring it into my own inner knowledge and my take on it may not be your take on it, but I, I, I guess in my own spiritual journeys, I've learned to re, uh, rely on my own uh, inner knowing to be uh, far superior, at least with relation to me. Uh, in my life. So I don't care who tells me something. And I am certainly somebody who is, I've interviewed over a thousand people and been told everything under the sun and been warned about all sorts, sorts of things. I mean, in 2012, uh, I don't know if you know who Sean, Sean David Morton is, but he's a friend of mine. He called me up and said, don't go to Egypt. Oh, it's very bad. You know, you must cancel your trip. And I, I said, well, thanks, Sean, for the information, but I'm going. And so I went and we had a fabulous time. And it was, I'm so glad we did. And we had some very spiritual experiences there. And, and, um, and I think we contributed to helping the situation as well, which, of course, you can do. And so you've got to decide who you're going to believe. Who are you going to, are you going to listen to your own counsel? Are you going to? you have no choice in a certain sense, again, because you can't access a gate. Um, something could be wonderful, but if you can't access it, you're not going to get it. It doesn't matter whether you believe, you know, your belief. This is, you know, of course, a religious overlay using that word. So I have to say that um, I, I, I'm not um, concerned with it. I think that uh, if you have the inner no knowledge as a soul, if you really are, ready for a certain next step. If you're out of this sector, then you're going to the next sector because that's your whole entire, everything about your being is already there. You know what I mean? You're already yeah. in a sense there, your molecules and everything else. So ultimately that's when you really leave this sector. Okay. Not when someone decides, you know, or, not even when you decide. It's it's every part of you that has to be on board, so to speak. You know, you're not going to take only part of you. But I can say that the major gates. We're talking. I think in essence, going off this planet, ascension in essence. And I know there's spiritual teachings to the contrary. And so I don't believe that. Um, I believe that we are. Um, always have as individuals access to leaving this planet when we're ready. However, we're talking group ascension, we're talking mass ascensions, and that's kind of more what the guardians are really referring to. Um, and it has more to do with a, a timeline having to do with this earth sector and what's happening also to this planet, this plan net 
that we're, we're sort of resting on and involved in right here, it, you can still go play out your drama elsewhere. There are so many Earth-like planets, you know, that you can reincarnate to. So um, this is not the only game in town. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and I can really appreciate how you can look at our teachings, incorporate it into your own knowing, and still speak confidently on what you think and feel from what you've personally experienced. And I can really, really appreciate that and resonate with that. And it just overall gives me a lot of confirmation to the things that I have been recently thinking and feeling about things too. Yeah, I would just like to thank you so much for coming on my channel and providing all of us today with um, your insight and your higher knowing and just everything you've brought forth um, has been a lot of needed clarification, I feel, for um, a lot of us. So I just, again, thank you so much. And I hope that I get to speak with you again. And you'd like to All right. Well, I really enjoyed your questions, uh, the depth and complexity. And I think it's, you know, it's lovely to talk to a fellow traveler, someone who can talk on this level, uh, on a spiritual level. And I hope this interview will be, you know, welcome by people out there. And, uh, and we'll see what, where everything goes from here. But thank you. Yeah, it's great talking with you.